Welcome to episode five of Islands in the League, our exclusive YouTube series presented by our friends at DraftKings. Like always, this episode will have a little bit of fun, a little bit of humor, a little bit of seriousness, but I'd like to provide my own perspective on some comments made recently by Giannis Antetokounmpo about failure. We'd also like to have some fun with the GOAT debate. And as always, we're joined by our resident sports betting expert, Josh Applebaum from Visa. This is episode five. Let's get it. Wait, one minute. Ah, there he is. No, you look forward. <laughs> Wait, did you know the dog made it in yesterday? We look at sport through a very clear lens of winning and losing. It's a results-based endeavor. In game theory, basketball, for example, is a zero-sum game. One person's gain is equivalent to another person's loss. So the net change is zero. Zero-sum game. If we establish that the goal of sport is to win, then objectively, if you lose, you also fail. Failure, by its definition, is a lack of success, but success is directly related to expectation. Do you think the Oklahoma City Thunder had a successful season? I personally do. Do you think the Sacramento Kings had a successful season? I personally do. Well, what's the difference between them and Giannis and the Milwaukee Bucks? Well, there was an expectation that Giannis could lead the Bucks to another NBA championship. Under these parameters, the Bucs aren't the only team that didn't have a successful season and failed. The Clippers, for example. If Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are healthy, the expectation there was that they could lead the Clippers to the franchise's first NBA championship. Right now, two of the greatest players of all time, Steph Curry and LeBron James, are facing each other in the playoffs. And one of them will move on and be successful. And one of them will forever be a failure. <laughs> I don't think sport is that black and white. Otherwise, in every season, 29 teams will have failed and 400 and some players would also be failures. But look, one of the reasons that Giannis in the Bucks season can be called a failure is because Giannis has established a baseline of excellence. He's established a baseline of standard. He's established a baseline of expectation. And when his team or Giannis come up a little short, yeah, okay, I get it. They failed. They failed to win a championship. But Giannis was asked about this, and I thought the reporter asked a valid question. Giannis, how would you view this season? Would you view this season as a failure? There's always steps to it. You know, um, Michael Jordan played 15 years, won six championships. The other nine years was a failure? That's what you're telling me. You know, there's good days, bad days. Some days, some days you are able to uh, be successful, some days you're not. Some days it's your turn, some days it's not your turn. And that's what sports about. You don't always win. One of the points I wanted to make on Giannis's comments, specifically about bringing up Michael Jordan, is how reactionary we are in the moment. Failure, success, win, loss, right? It's all we ever talk about. Michael Jordan actually has a quote from 1989 in the Chicago Tribune. Asked after, again, the Bulls couldn't get past the Pistons. He says, I'm disappointed, but it's been an enjoyable season, and we proved to a lot of people we're a team to watch in the future. You're damn right they were. Six championships later, talk of being the GOAT. It isn't just about the moment. It isn't just about the success and failure of a game, a series, a season. Sport is about the journey. Sport is bigger than just winning a ring. We ask all the time on this podcast, and I ask this to former athletes all the time, what do you miss most? I've asked that to non-champions. I've asked that to champions. And almost always, the response is, I just miss the competition. I miss the camaraderie. I miss the collaboration. I miss my teammates, the locker room, the feeling of playing in front of 20,000 people. Those are the things we miss. Those are the things we love about sports. Think about you as a fan. I think about this now with my own kids when I take them to games. What are your favorite memories of sport? What are they? Is it just about a championship? Is that all you remember? Do you remember sitting around with your family every Thanksgiving watching the Dallas Cowboys lose? You probably do. It probably was enjoyable. It was probably fun. See, I'm looking at this through a different lens. Basketball 
by definition, is a zero-sum game. Somebody wins. Somebody loses. But to me, basketball and sport is more than that. And that's what Giannis is trying to get at. That's what Dame was trying to get at on our podcast back in March. Because Dame's another guy where so many people ask him questions about success, failure, rings, coming up short. We asked him, how does he maintain his sanity? Because I have a real life. Like, I think that's the best way to put it. Like, I don't live my life as Damian Lillard. Like, I go home, I play with my kids. (laughs) Like, I play with my kids, I go to my mom's house, I hang out with my cousins, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I have a life. I have, I talk to my grandmother on the phone and I have a life that's stable and is not based upon who I am as an NBA player. Like, I have real friends, you know? Like, I don't sit here and just think about, I need to leave all the time. And I'm not sitting there watching TV and hearing everything they got to say, like, oh, I need to. I probably should do this or I probably should do that. I'm like, when my career is over, y'all are not about to be talking about me. I played 15 seasons in the NBA, four seasons at Duke. I won a state championship in high school. It still bothers me that I didn't win a championship at Duke. It still bothers me that I didn't win an NBA championship. I think about that all the time, if I'm being honest. It doesn't haunt me, but it's a wish. It's something that I wanted to do. It's a goal. but. I don't look at my career in any way, shape, or form as a failure because the reality is I took so much from it. I gave so much to it. And that's what Giannis is saying. That's what Dame is saying. I'm not saying to ignore the failures. I'm saying a player's career, a team's arc, a team's path is actually about the journey. Think about one of the greatest players ever, Hakeem Olajuwon. I just want to take you through part of his career. 1985, the Houston Rockets lose 3-2 to Utah in the first round. 1986, they lose in the NBA Finals. 1987, they lose 4-2 to Seattle in the second round. 1988, they lose in the first round to Dallas. In 89, they lose in the first round to Seattle. In 1990, they lose in the first round to the Lakers. Oh, and by the way, Hakeem wasn't good in that series. He stunk in game one and two. In 1991, swept by the Lakers in the first round. 92, they don't even make the playoffs. 93, they lose 4-3 to Seattle in the second round. 1994, he's a champion. 1995, he's a champion. 31 and 32 years old. You go through all of this. LeBron, 27 when he first won. Steph, 27 when he first won. Jordan, 28 when he first won. Kobe, 30 when he first won a championship without Shaq. These things take time. It's part of the journey. It's part of the arc. Enjoy it. Oh, and by the way, 94, 95. There's something interesting about those years in the night. Oh, that's right, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was retired in 1994 and only played in a few games in 95 before the Bulls were eliminated. You see, success and failure isn't just about what you do. Success and failure is oftentimes relegated to chance, timing, happenstance. Think about all the things that have to go right, all the things that can't go wrong for a win and a loss, for success and failure. Is it wrong to say maybe there's some dumb luck involved? You can prepare, you can work, you can train, you can do all the right things. It doesn't guarantee anything. I think that's part of what makes sports so great. I guess the question here is, where does success and failure end? What is the demarcation line? Is it at the end of a player's career? Is it at the end of a season? At the end of a series? At the end of a month? At the end of a game? At the end of a quarter? If I miss a shot, am I a failure until I make my next shot? Or is it all just a part of my journey? And going back to Hakeem Olajuwon, look, I've said this many times, he's one of the 12, 15, I don't know where he ranks, but he's one of the greatest players ever. He's in my top 12 to 15 of the greatest players ever. And a large part of that is because he won in 94 and 95. No, there's no fucking asterisk next to it because Jordan was not there. There's not. Because I realize how hard it is to win. And when I think about Akeem, I don't think about the failures in the playoffs. I think about Akeem 
and the perseverance, the greatness, the winning towards the end. Think about all that went into that, right? It is about the journey. I go back to an episode we did last fall with our friend Hassan Minaj, where he talks about the importance, the inspiration of Hakeem Olajuwon in his life. This is a huge deal. I'm growing up in Sacramento. Hakeem Olajuwon, right before the playoffs, comes to Sacramento and goes to Friday prayer. And I remember he came to the mosque and there was just a bunch of kids there at the mosque. And we went ballistic. We could not believe, like, one of the best NBA players in the world at the time. This is peak Hakeem. Comes to the mosque. We all run around him. Every kid's trying to, like, pray next to him. And I remember he gave this speech at the end. He, like, let the little kids, like, kind of huddle around him. And he gave the speech, and he was just like, hey, kids, like, make sure you listen to your parents. Make sure you pray, and you're, you're like, grateful to God. And just remember that attitude is everything. Think about what Hakeem meant for kids all over the world. Think about what Giannis means for kids all over the world. Think about what sport means. Think about how it's all intertwined. It's all intertwined in the journey. It's not about a game, a series, a season. It's about the journey. And for those of you who think I'm letting Giannis off the hook, Giannis, you lost. Are we good? And this is where we get into non-duality versus duality. Both can be true. Giannis and the Bucks failed to win a championship. But the entire season was not a failure. And like I said, I didn't win a championship, but I had a hell of a career. If, if you don't count the end in Dallas, but whatever. <laughs> With another mind-blowing playoff performance, Steph Curry has potentially entered the GOAT debate, according to some. And with Steph Curry and LeBron James currently battling it out in the Western Conference semifinals, I thought maybe we could check in on NBA Twitter to see where we're at in the GOAT debate. Most All-NBA selections. Most Finals MVPs. Most All-NBA First Team selections. Highest career scoring average. Most playoff win shares. Most First Team All-Defensive selections. Most steals in the playoffs. Most scoring championships. Most points scored all-time. Uh, McDonald's, most points scored in the playoffs. Gatorade, most playoff games won. Home Alone? You know, I was, I was in the cardboard cutout. Best value over replacement player in the regular season. Six straight rings. Did someone say rings? One, two, Here we go. three, four. We get it. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One hundred. Points in a game. Meet me in Temecula. Most playoff game-winning buzzer beaters. Now, y'all know you can't get a bucket without an assist. This is very Ted Lasso. Most all-star selections. Same. Also, the most MVP awards. Most points in an all-star game. If I could be like my best value over replacement player in the playoffs. Steph better. Most blocks. Most dominant. Most three-pointers. I believe I can fly. Most seasons with a winning record. I am the GOAT at life. Space Jam. Space Jam 2. Really? Yeah, I know. Jason, who is your who is your goat? So non-committal. Do you factor in when you talk about the goat? Do you factor in the quality and longevity and sort of brand recognition of their signature sneaker? No. You, you don't. don't. Never. Because if we're doing that, here's a hot take. That'll get me in trouble. <laughs> my hot take is that. All right, we're going to welcome in Josh Applebaum from VEASAN to talk some NBA playoffs. All right, let's welcome in Josh Applebaum from VEASAN. Josh, thanks so much for joining us today. JJ, it's great to be with you. And are you having fun yet? We're getting closer and closer <laughs> uh, to uh, the conference uh, finals here and pretty soon the NBA finals. And we're seeing a lot of movement in the betting market. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, actually. I, first of all, the games, I think, have been fantastic. We were treated to some classics over the weekend. And then last night, the Miami Heat go up 3-1 on the Knicks and the Lakers go up 3-1 on the Warriors in another game that came down to the wire. I want to talk specifically about the Lakers and just kind of check in 
with where they are in terms of championship odds, the the sort of odds for them to win the title, and how those lines have sort of moved over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, so JJ, in particular with the Lakers, it's really interesting because, remember, they were pretty much a below 500 team for much of the early portion of the season, but you still had the odds makers in Vegas and across the market still showing respect to LeBron and Anthony Davis. We saw what they did, obviously, in the bubble, winning that NBA title, and you always were saying, hey, you know, they're not looking very good, but if they can stay healthy, they had a really good trade deadline, bringing in some new uh, new players here and breathing some new life in here, D'Angelo Russell and Vanderbilt, some of these other guys that they picked up. Uh, so even though when they weren't playing very well, you still saw them hovering around like 20 to one to win the NBA title, 15 to one. But we've seen a huge uh, increase here or to the advantage of the Lakers so far this postseason. So uh, you, you've seen them so far when they started the postseason, they're one of the biggest odds in terms of uh, getting better throughout the postseason. So they started uh, with the Lakers. They were plus uh, 1400 before round one to win the NBA title. Now they're down to plus 350. JJ, they have the second best odds overall to win the NBA title. Only the Boston Celtics have better odds at plus 155. To win the West, we've seen the Lakers go from plus 600 prior to uh, the first round now to plus 140. So uh, I think what you're seeing now is really the cream rising to the top. And JJ, you can speak to this a little bit more, but when you have those big name players, those one or two you know, top guys really in the postseason, that's what wins. The depth may really guide you throughout the regular season but when you get to crunch time as long as these guys can stay healthy and that was the knock on the lakers it was they were inconsistent but then also you're always kind of worrying when will that when will that shoe drop you know lebron's been hurt uh you know off and on again last couple years anthony davis is always a questionable guy when you're trying to play daily fantasy you never know if he's going to leave a game early so the fact that they're healthy the fact these odds have moved so much my question to you, JJ, would be, are we looking toward a Celtics-Lakers, you know, yeah. uh, redo here from the 1980s? As of right now, Celtics plus 155, Lakers plus 350. These would be the two two favorites here to meet up in the NBA Finals. And as of right now, the Celtics are the odds-on favorite. They're minus 195 to win the Eastern Conference. I think of the Lakers, what's interesting is even when they were struggling, I think the betting markets were giving them a healthy amount of respect. And certainly you can point to the trade deadline as a an inflection point in their season, right? 16 and seven uh, after the deadline, um, or from March 1st on rather. And they've done it with their defense. They've done it with their defense again in the postseason, uh, specifically in this uh, series against the Warriors. But I would also add that it's very rare to see a player improve as much as one player has as Austin Reeves has. And for him to be a primary creator at times in the half court with a team that features LeBron James and Anthony Davis, I think this has been as important, if not more important, than the added depth and the roster cohesiveness that happened post-trade deadline. And you think about LeBron specifically, how many times has he actually, he's played well, don't get me wrong. How many times has he gone absolutely nuclear so far in these playoffs, right? There are so many times where he gets to rest a little bit when when they're on offense and he's taking possessions off, off the ball. And that's not typical of LeBron in the playoffs. And they've allowed Austin Reeves to play out of pick and roll, to create. And I think that has been huge for the Lakers. So as much as it is about LeBron, as much as it is about Anthony Davis and his two-way play, I have to acknowledge like the reason I, I'm feeling so momentum here personally for the Lakers is because of the emergence of Austin Reeves. And that makes a ton of sense, JJ, too. I'm actually kicking uh, my I'm kicking the Celtics here, my favorite team, because I remember watching March Madness, Austin Reeves, I think it was Oklahoma, played great. I believe it was either a second round pick or maybe it was undrafted. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. That, Oklahoma State. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was the yeah, Oklahoma he State. Was, awesome. was the Oklahoma? Who's Oklahoma? I think it was the Sooners, but this is a Wichita guy that's got State all the to tools Oklahoma. And, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yes. I do as a state in there. So far. <laughs> <laughs> Let's well, I, you know, before we go to the Celtics 76ers, because there is something I want to point out there that I find very interesting in the betting markets. I do want to talk about Suns Nuggets, because it still feels like to me that Suns Nuggets potentially the winner of this series to me feels like the favorites. And prior to the uh start of the Western Conference playoffs, I said Suns were, were my favorites. And then the Nuggets played so well through seven games, 4-1 against Minnesota, up 2-0 against the uh, Suns. And then we see this uh, essentially a rotation change, right, where Okogie and Craig get less minutes. 
Monty Williams goes to Terrence Ross, to Landry Shamit, to uh, TJ Warren. Campaign, of course, has to come in. Landale now is playing big minutes for them as well. And, and it just feels like it's completely shifted this series. So how is this affected, if anything, the Suns and Nuggets titles odds as we head into game five later tonight? So it's interesting, JJ, uh, even though this series you know, has been super competitive and tied thus far, you're seeing a big difference in the market based on how the odds makers are treating these two teams. So big hint thing here would be the Chris Paul injury for the Phoenix Suns. You actually saw the Suns, uh, they opened this one. They were uh, plus 450 to win the title. Now they're plus 650. So if you get it, you got a futures there, bet there early when Kevin Durant took over, you're feeling pretty good about it. The Chris Paul injury, you've seen this team slip a little bit now. Now on the flip side, you know, one team's one man's trash is another man's treasure where you see one team rise. The other team's going to fall a bit. Denver Nuggets have really ticked up here. They were uh, plus 350 uh, to, win the, uh, to win the West. Now they're plus 190. And to win the title, they're plus 1,000. Now the Nuggets are plus 450, uh, second best or uh, third best odds here be behind the Lakers and the Celtics. So uh, obviously we've seen uh, home court be really, really important here. It's unbelievable from a betting standpoint in this zigzag theory, JJ, where if you lose one game, you come back and play very well. The next game, we've seen those teams. If you lose, you come back and cover actually almost 69% of the time. So that's been one thing that the betters have been paying attention to. But let me ask you, JJ, the Chris Paul injury, you know, is that going to stop uh, the Suns from beating the Nuggets here? Or if you still have, you know, Drant and Booker, do you still have a fighter's chance? Even though, again, going into altitude and having the Nuggets with game seven uh, home court, it's still still uh, basically from the odds makers, they're saying the Nuggets are still the bet. But my question to you, JJ, is how big was that Chris Paul injury to the Suns? Well, I got asked about it. Uh prior to game three you know we 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 watched them win game two sort of an ugly game chris paul gets hurt in that game they announced he's likely out for games three and four he'll also be out for game five as well uh and i said that, look i think the formula right is kevin duran and, and devin booker have to continue to make shots and they've got to get production from their bench well they've done that the question is about sustainability in this series in particular because we probably won't see much if any of chris paul and so I think they still can get by the Phoenix Suns in this series. Um, they're going to need 22 points off the bench in game three. TJ Warren with two big buckets in the fourth quarter, 40 points off the bench in game four. And of course, the stellar play of Durant and Booker, they're going to need all of that to beat the Denver Nuggets. My thing is in the next series, whether it is the Warriors or whether it is the Lakers uh, in the conference finals, if the Suns were to advance, they're going to need Chris Paul specifically against the Lakers. Because of the way that LeBron thinks the game, I really believe you've got to have a counterpoint to that if you're the Phoenix Suns. And Chris Paul, one of the most intelligent basketball minds that, of course, I've ever been around and potentially in NBA history. So I think his, his availability and effectiveness will matter eventually. I do think they can get by the Nuggets. I still have the Nuggets as my favorite to win this series. Uh, and, of course, Game 5 tonight on, on Tuesday night. Uh, Celtic Sixers. I just want to point something out really quick. And, and, and I also want to acknowledge that a lot of these uh, title shifts in odds uh, are a direct result of the Milwaukee Bucks losing in the first round. And a lot of this favoritism right now towards the Celtics, I believe, is because the Milwaukee Bucks aren't looming there in the finals. It likely will be the Miami Heat, but whether it's the Heat or the Knicks, the Celtics, the assumption would be they're the heavy favorites in that series. What's interesting to me is I think going into a game five tonight where it's 2-2 in a, a very contested series, close games, the, the Celtics have looked good at some points, the 76ers have looked good at some points, in a close series where the winner of the series is likely to win the Eastern Conference. The 76ers' Eastern Conference odds have not shifted from the start of the playoffs, plus 400 to plus 400. Their title odds have actually gone down from plus 900 to plus 1100. And if you look, it seems like there's an imbalance there. If you're talking about a, a, maybe a, a flyer or a smart bet with, with heavy odds, the Celtics at plus 155 and the 76ers at plus 1100, that seems a little out of balance to me. You're totally right, JJ. And I think from the better standpoint, it's not always what you're betting on what will happen or what you expect to happen, but it's also the value of the number. So when you're tied to two, and obviously we've seen, you know, the games that James Harden has gone off 
Uh, the Celtics really haven't had any, uh, you know, kind of answer to him. You would think Marcus Smart, uh, Smart could kind of lock him down. Haven't really seen that. Jalen Brown had a little bit of success here, but uh, to me, to your point here, would you rather have the minus or the plus uh, eleven hundred here, a thousand here for the Sixers, or a plus one fifty five for Boston? Now Boston's more likely to get it done, but from a betting perspective, you're getting pretty good value on the Sixers. The thing with me, JJ, when it comes to the Boston Celtics, now uh, they were going into the playoffs plus 350 to win the NBA title. Now they're plus 155. So the number has gotten shorter. They're a minus number. I believe you mentioned this. They're a minus number to win the East now. And again, they've been the biggest beneficiary of the Milwaukee Bucks bowing out early. They're now minus 195. You have to lay a minus number for them to win the East. It's very rare that you get a team that's a minus number, uh, you know, just a couple rounds in to win their respective conference. So it tells you, the, really the path is opening for Boston here, much more competitive out West. Uh, but my question to you, just as a Celtics fan, a JJ is Joe Missoula. He's getting a lot of criticism here in the Boston media market. You turn on talk radio. There's a lot of questions about Missoula. He's only 34 years old. Again, he was a, what your front runner for coach of the year for much of the year, but really in these crunch time, really important situations, it feels like he's making some of these mistakes here, you know, kind of repeating the same mistake over and over again. Uh, I'd love your take on JJ. You know, if you're down by a point, should you call a timeout? You listen to talk radio. Everyone's mad at Missoula for not calling timeouts and kind of getting a play in. Uh, also, why is Marcus Smart taking these last shots? So should there be more White and Brogdon? My question to you would be, is Missoula going to cost the Celtics a championship or is coaching a little bit overrated in the NBA where as long as Brown and Tatum are playing well, they should be okay? Well, I don't think Missoula is going to cost them. And, and specifically, if we look at uh, game four, Jalen Brown has admitted that he gambled on that double team uh, on Embiid, which led to a wide open James Harden three. That's not on Joe Missoula, right? Those are those are basic principles of NBA basketball. You're not going to help off the strong side corner. And Jalen Brown tried to make a play and he made a mistake. Um, on the end of game stuff, it's interesting because, you know, I went and rewatched today, actually, uh, the end of play of game one where they went to Marcus Smart quick. And I'm, I'm trying to read sort of what they're setting up. And it looked like it was a fake stagger pin down for Jalen Brown, Horford, and Tatum going to get him. And then Tatum, the middle guy, the first screener, was supposed to slip to the basket. And it was just the angle that Smart took. It was the spacing of Al Horford where he ended up setting that second screen. There was just too many guys together. And that slip to the basket for Tatum wasn't really open. So I don't necessarily hate the play call. It was just poor execution in some ways. Now, on game four, different perspective on it. And my perspective on that is you've got timeouts. You've got enough time. It's not about, at that point in the game, to me, trying to dictate the lineups, right? We want the Sixers to have their offense line up on the floor. We don't want to call timeout to put their defensive lineup on the floor. To me, you have enough times and you have multiple timeouts where you at that point can manage the game. You can manage the game. And for them not to get a shot off, it's an indictment on the entire team, right? You, you got to go quicker if you're the guys on the floor. I don't hate the play call. You're trying to get a switch Tatum on Maxi attacking the basket. I don't hate the play call. It's just a little bit of mismanagement of the clock. And some of it is on the players not going quick enough, and some of it is on Joe Missoula. The, po the one point I want to make out, and he's since admitted I should have called timeout after at first saying I want to let my players play. There's, you know, I don't have the exact stats in front of me, but there's been about 25 times this season where the Celtics have been in that opportunity uh, or been in that scenario where it's end of game, tie ball game, you're down, whatever it may be, and you have an opportunity to call a timeout versus going. And in the 11 possessions where they've decided to not call timeout and just let let it play out, uh, they've scored eight points. They've had like four turnovers. They, I think, made two of six shots. Like They, they haven't done a good job in those situations of executing. And, and, and I get what he's saying. You trust the players. I trust my players. And, and that's empowering to a degree, but it is on the coach a little bit to manage that situation and their numbers on the other 17 or 18 possessions, whatever it is where they have called timeout, uh, their points per possession are higher, their turnovers are down. So they're clearly getting better looks. Um, but I called a game uh, earlier this year that went into double overtime with the Knicks and they had two opportunities, one out of a timeout, one just straight playing to get a last second shot. And in both cases, they ran the, the clock too low before they got Tatum the ball. And so this, to me, is a theme. It's, it's, it's clock management as much as it is about execution. I think Joe Mazzulla has done an outstanding job. I had him in my top three for coach of the year. It's uh, noteworthy to point out he took the team over uh, two days before training camp, and he was a, a behind-the-bench guy. 
I have to give him a lot of credit. That team has built an identity, and it's a learning experience for a first-time head coach when you get to the playoffs and you've got to manage games late. Uh, so, of course, you can place some of the blame on Missoula. I wouldn't place all of the blame, if that makes sense. Uh, Josh, awesome as always. We appreciate the time. Uh, this has been Islands of the League. Check in with Josh Applebaum from VEASAN. Thanks, bud. As always, thank you for watching Islands and League and everything on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, please go hit that subscribe button.